Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge & Company. You cannot have more success in the news business than Richard C. Wald has had. He's edited newspapers, run two television network news divisions, and now is a prestigious and much sought-after professor at the Columbia School of Journalism. Welcome. Thank you. So you've seen it all. When did you start? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to make us sound, you sound old, so I have to say we're contemporaries. Right. Right. Um, sort of. You're younger, but prettier. No. All right. That's, uh, I'm older, but prettier, maybe. Uh -huh. Anyway, go on. Tell me when you started working in the news business. Um, well, I became a copy boy for the New York Post when I was in high school. It only lasted two months, and I got fired. I don't remember why I got fired, uh, but actually I had to get fired because I was going to go to college, and I couldn't keep those hours. And in college, I became a stringer for the New York Herald Tribune uh, when I was in my senior year. And I just have been in the news business ever since. Did you, what made you want to go into the news business to begin with? It was easy. And no, come on. Well, no, it was. I mean, how did you get to the New York Post as a copy boy? Well, that was, I went to Stuyvesant High School. And they had a thing where they would get you jobs. Oh. And for some reason, um, uh, somebody said, I was on the high school newspaper. Yeah. And uh, somebody said, there's a job at the New York Post. And I went, I had been uh, a, a counter boy at <laughs> a, on 2nd Avenue and 10th Street where the bus stopped. Uh, there was a candy store, and it had a, a seat, a window, open window to where the bus stop was, and you could give people stuff, and, and yeah. I worked that window. And being a copy boy sounded easier. And so. <laughs> well, did you write? Boy. Were you a good writer? Yeah, I was a, an okay writer. I always uh, thought I could never go into the newspaper business. I always wanted to marry a foreign correspondent. <laughs> Forget it. <laughs> but anyway, I thought I could never be in the news business because I didn't know if I could write well enough to do it. But that's really not even the main ingredient, is it? Well, it, it depends. Um, it, it is the main ingredient for some people whose, whose real value to the paper is writing. Uh, uh, look at Tom Wolfe. He's a very smart man. Most people don't know he's a PhD in American uh, history and in American literature. But um, what made him valuable to newspapers was the way he wrote and the strength of his writing. It wasn't what was in his mind, it was in his expression. In his way. And, um, and so there are very valuable people whose greatest strength is the way they write. There are also great people of great value who can't write. Um, Jim Bellows, who was the editor of the Herald Tribune and hired Tom Wolfe, uh, can write, but to the level of about a high school senior in a pretty good high school. And what about investigative reporters? Do they have to be good writers? Some do, some don't. It depends on how you, how you do your work. But the reason a lot of investigative reporters are in teams is some guys are better at looking at records and, then other. and other guys are better at putting it together. Now, on television, is what's the prerequisite or the talent that's needed for that? other than a good voice and a nice appearance? Well, you got to be, writing for television is very hard because naturally people write for the eye. And there you have to write for the ear and for a conversation. And you got to learn how to do it. But more than that, you have to marry the words to the pictures. And it's not impossible to master. It just takes time. Does a reporter? on television write their own script? Most do. Most do. Um, anchors can't because there's so much stuff coming in so late, so, so they get people to help them. But most reporters write their own scripts, except that uh, television is much more a cooperative enterprise than writing for, your, writing for a newspaper. So you get a reporter and a producer who work together, and very often a producer who will be more responsible for the pictures than for the words will block out a script. You gotta, we're going to run the pictures this way, so you've got to start with that thing. And is the producer of the program the editor? Yes. Um, 
There's an overall, what, what, in television, there's an overall producer, and then there are segment producers. That's right. Um, and well, actually, there are three layers. There is an executive producer. Mm -hmm. Then there are usually people who take care of one area or another. On a network program, you get somebody who takes care of national news, somebody who takes care of international news, and somebody who takes care of everything else. And then the reporters in the field work with what are usually called field producers. And uh, so there are a lot of checks and balances by the time something gets on the air. So now when you're teaching at Columbia, do, are the different um, forms of media separated as far as what you learn? Mm, well, yes and no. Uh, the basic courses are not separated. There's the, the core course at Columbia Journalism School is called reporting and writing and everybody takes it there are slight differences but there are you can go into a reporting and writing class with a professor of broadcasting or with a professor of newspaper or books or something but the basic stuff is the same later in the second term it's a two term 10 month course uh, you get to specialize mm. do you started so you were a reporter originally yeah. At mm -hmm. the Herald Tribune. Yeah. This is a question I've always wanted to ask. Is the Herald Tribune, do you think that was a better paper than the New York Times? It was much better written. Um, and it could have been a better paper, my own belief is, not casting any uh, aspersions on others, that the, what killed it was the owners, not the, not the uh, public or the people mm. who worked on it. They simply, for a very long time, until the middle until about 1950, they just took all the profits out of it mm -hmm. and wouldn't invest anything in it, with the result that the times where they reinvested the profits all the time got to be a sturdier business enterprise. And as things turned down and as things got more expensive, the Tribune had fewer assets, the Times had more, and gradually it began to show in the newspaper fewer reporters, fewer correspondents, fewer. But those few were people who the Tribune prized writing, the Times prized completeness, and ultimately the Times won. So who were some of the writers at the Tribune? Well, um, Joe Gould, uh, Sinclair McKelway, um, uh, um, <laughs> I'm I'm suddenly stumped because there were so many, mm -hmm. but um, uh, the... What about uh, my husband? Well, I, he came later. I'm, I'm starting way <laughs> Early. back. Uh, you better mention him or uh, else okay, I'm not Okay, I'll be mention your husband, but, but your husband was part of My husband a being change. Jimmy Breslin. <laughs> Jimmy Breslin was part of a change that the Tribune made in the way newspapers report. Uh. Uh, originally, the writing that was prized was the writing that created the New Yorker. Almost all of the New Yorker people in the early days were oh, Herald Tribune uh, writers. Then uh, a whole lot of people from the Herald Tribune became writers for Broadway and for movies. In its later phases, the Tribune went into what is now called the new journalism, was then called, oh my God, what are you doing? And that group was Jimmy Breslin, Dick Schapp, Tom Wolfe, and a group of other people who were not quite as famous as they were, right. but were, were writing in the same vein. And they did change uh, what happens in newspapers because their core change was to take the techniques of fiction but write about truth. And it, if you read any newspaper today, you will see leads that were once totally unacceptable. Uh, you will see stories about subjects that were not at all right for newspapers. And you will see an amount of involvement that were not then thought to be right. The Tribune got a lot of uh, anti, my God, what are you doing comment. But ultimately, everybody came into the fold. It, Tribune was an interesting paper because it was always taking a chance. Mm -hmm. um, the book review section, for instance, now a very well-known part of the New York Times, other major newspapers, was started by the Herald Tribune. Uh, the idea of reviewing paperbacks 
was started in the Herald Tribune. They were, they were always taking a chance on something. And they took a chance on Jimmy Breslin, among others. So did television go through similar development stages? Yeah. Um, television... When did you make the switch? In 1968. You became a, an editor at the Tribune. Yes, ultimately. You were yeah. a foreign correspondent I'd been a also? foreign correspondent and a, a city hall reporter. I was the religion editor for a while. <laughs> um, and I then became, I went overseas and I came back from overseas to be an editor. Uh, and after the Tribune folded, I banged around at a bunch of different jobs and wound up at NBC. And uh, television is interesting because in its earliest days, the people who started in television were the people who probably couldn't get a job in radio. Radio was all, where all the money was right. and where all the important people were. And remember, Murrow started in radio. Right. A whole bunch of other major figures were in radio. Edward P. Morgan. Edward P. Morgan. <laughs> I and, loved his uh, voice. Hans Kaltenborn. Yes. H.V. Uh, Kaltenborn. Right. Um, but what happened was, and recently you've seen a lot of stuff about Don Hewitt uh, retiring. Right. Don Hewitt started in television when there was no television. I mean, they, uh, right. and those people are still around. They invented the forms that you now think are the only way you can do television. But at the time, nobody knew how to do it. And so guys like uh, Reuven Frank, who lives in New Jersey now, and Don Hewitt and a bunch of other people figured out how to put supers on the screen, figured out how to do an interview so that you could cut it easily, figured out how to take one camera and make it look like two cameras. Uh, they figured all this stuff out as they went. And the evolution of television was a little different from the way newspapers work in the sense that it's relatively new. Newspapers have been in the same mold roughly so since 1900. But television uh, has had various revolutions in its short life because although it was invented before World War II, it didn't really come into its own until 1948 with the conventions. Uh, it's when the FCC 48. also lifted the freeze yeah. of issuing licenses and everything, everything had stopped, right? Yeah, but, but the convention of you needed interconnection. Yeah. And the only interconnection so ran down the East Coast in a thing called coaxial cable. With cable, I remember that. And with the convention in Philadelphia, um, you were able, it was right on top of the coaxial cable. You could feed that whole piece of the country with the same picture. Now, were you at NBC when the Queen was coronated, when Princess... No, I, I was, uh, that was before I got right. into television. And, right. uh, yeah, but it was... Uh, <laughs> that it was, was pretty good, because that was all motorcycles and reels exactly of film and all so. that kind of stuff. Yeah, but no tape. You had yeah. to develop the right, picture the film, and then, and then, then you had it. to get it here, and it was a whole marathon. I was at yeah. CBS then. Did you go to the 68 convention? Yes, I went to the 68 convention. Uh, as a television person? As a television, as a television person, yeah. So what was that like as compared to now? Tell us that. Well, let's I had let's just... Let's look at the convention coverage since we have conventions coming oh, up. Oh, well, uh, it's interesting because in those days, there were, the primaries were not as well developed as they are now. It was the McGovern Commission that created the system that made the primaries binding, it was the reformers that sort of have totally messed up. As far as I'm concerned, I think there's something very wrong with this system. Well, but. well they reformed the conventions out of business right. is what they did. They did. They took the choosing power from the convention to the primaries. But also television had a role in that with the direct buys of advertisements. Sure. It, just, and, it, it had an enormous impact on the way we carry yeah. on politics in this country. Well, yes and no. It had an enormous impact in the sense that everybody had to take, pay attention to it. Everybody had to, you had to be telegenic. Uh, in the uh, Kennedy-Nixon debate, right. Nixon won on radio and he lost on television. Uh, there's Jack Kennedy looking like Jack Kennedy and there's Richard Nixon looking like Richard Nixon. Needing to shave. Uh, needing a shave and all that sort of stuff. Um, I think that was part of it, but there, there were other parts of it. But nonetheless, um, the the whole question of television, its availability and its impact really diminished the strength of the, uh, of the party machinery 
because you, if you could afford it and raise the money, could go directly to a public right. and uh, make your own fortune, uh, political fortune, that is. And the result of all that was, in 68, it was not yet changed for the convention. Uh, there was still some choosing to be done at the convention. There were still some fights to be had about what it is that the party stands for and how it will go forward. Today, by the time you finish with the primaries, somebody has won. His platform is the party platform. There's not much to do at the convention except have a party, entertain each other. Conventions, I believe, still have one huge function. Our parties, diminished in strength though they may be, are national. The people who make up the party, the real workers, the real backbone, talk to each other a lot, but don't see each other. You have a convention, and what they do is they make the friendships, they renew the alliances, they, they in effect, create what party there is. And I think that's the value of the conventions, but that's not a news value. It's not a public value. It's a private value. And it only creates, it's only a value to the people who attend the convention. I mean, I think increasingly yeah. one of the major problems with the politics of today is the inability of the average citizen to really participate in a meaningful way in a lot of places. Now, in some places you can. New York, for instance, it's very difficult. If you want to raise money, everybody wants you to do that. But if you want to go and do, you know, even to address envelopes, there are no envelopes that are being sent out anymore. It's a whole different change. You know, it, there is, and, and I'm not sure. You work for a candidate more than, yes. right, that's right. And, and the convention is a party thing, and the primaries are a candidate thing, and we've shifted all the emphasis <laughs> to the candidates. So we don't have all that fun of watching. I mean, it was the greatest oh. cinema verite. Yeah. Of, it was so wonderful to be able to sit down and watch those conventions day and night. Well, when I was an undergraduate, the, we were, the group of friends I had, were riveted by the fight at the convention between Stevenson, the ultimate candidate, and everybody else who <coughs> came in at the time. It was, it was an enormous fight. It took many votes. We stayed up late at night. It was a wonderful thing. Now, um, you know who the candidate is. You know who the vice presidential choice is. That isn't uh, it's amazing, any longer isn't a question. It? You know what the platform will be. Nobody's going to walk out the way the Dixiecrats walked out. Uh, there isn't a 68. fight for the soul of the party uh, in either camp. Um, it, there, in a sense, there's no news there. In a sense, it's, it's, it's a party. So we used to see the stars on the floor of a convention. And remember, of course, what comes to mind is John Chancellor being carried out. Yeah. Were you there then, or were you? Uh, no, I wasn't there when he was carried out, but I was there at other <laughs> conventions with John. And, and, yeah, uh, and so much fun. I mean, who were the reporters who were there on, on the floor? Well, they were the, the leading political reporters of the day. And they would get out on the floor because... If there was a fight about the platform, the question was, how will this state or that political leader or right. this individual person vote, go, look for? Or when there was a fight about a vice presidential candidate, who are you yeah, supporting? Right. And, and the people on the floor made a decision and made a difference. Right now, but nothing. now they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so now you have the anchors that go, they have, sit at a desk. And that's basically, and what, and we're limiting it, the television now to what three hours a night for the all the no, prime no, speakers. No, 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 three hours a week. A week. Oh. One hour oh. a night, three nights. Um, and for just... the major, for the broadcast networks, the um, the twenty-four hour systems are going to carry are going to carry as much as they want and... or think there's any audience interest in. But that's because it's cheap. You've already paid yeah, for the right. uh, uh, So the political coverage. conventions are less exciting and the campaigning is not as exciting as it used to be. It's all very local, too, isn't it? A lot, I mean, Sunday morning on television is national right. politicking, right? But then the work the candidates do in between is all basically local events. 
Yeah, except that it's local events with an eye toward a national audience. What so you it gets want picked up on the is, yeah, you so want to be in Dearborn, Michigan, yeah. with a message that will reverberate uh, in Pennsylvania. So you speak locally, but you address nationally. Right. Did you enjoy television more than newspapers, or newspapers, or is that, it's not fair to compare? It's really not fair to compare the power of television is astounding. Yeah. It's absolutely astounding. I, I saw Richard Holbrook a while ago. Um, many years ago, he was an advisor to NBC when I was the president of NBC News on the first, last, and only three-hour long uh, discussion of how does the United States create foreign policy and what does it mean and how can you get involved. It was in January, I don't remember the year, 70, I think. That program probably was the lowest rated program of the week. Almost certainly was the lowest program. But it had, uh, my recollection is, 7 million viewers. 7 million viewers is more people <laughs> than read Foreign Affairs Quarterly from that day to this. Uh, it, it had enormous power. Well, the because you speak to a whole country, because the whole country has 290 million people in it, if you speak only to those people who are active in the field that you're reporting on, politics, you are speaking to an enormously powerful audience. If they hear what you say, it is powerful in terms of how the country governs itself. If they don't hear what it what you say, it's powerful in terms of getting you fired. <laughs> <laughs> but if we could have that kind of a program today, no network could put it on, right? Well, there wouldn't be much audience for it. And and audiences don't and don't gather. For television it. news is not necessarily. Um, it doesn't have. It doesn't perceive itself as having um, a leadership role as far as formulating opinions or no, something? No, it does not. And but I don't think it ever did. I think it always saw itself as following what it is that, that, it does. Uh, that is done. Um, Which do you think now, now, I mean, so much has changed just financially with the newspapers, with the concentrated ownership and the circulation as we see, sometimes fudged and sometimes not, but everything based on that bottom line kind of thing. Television is the same way, right? Yeah, it is, except that television in the networks still has that sense of public obligation, no longer enforced by fairness doctrine and other things, but still, if there's sound. going to be an important speech by the president or by the leader of the opposition or by whatever, television will cover it. No ratings, no uh, income, no commercials. Uh, and television will still do it because there is a public obligation. It is diminishing, but it's still and there. And as that, as that diminishes and as public regulation diminishes, will that continue, do you think? Yes, I think it will because primarily for two reasons. The first is that television news, oddly to my mind, still fights for the high ground. I want to be, if I'm in television news, if I'm running one of these divisions, I want to be, be seen the as the best in the business, the smartest, the yeah. fastest, the most insightful and everything. They compete for the high ground. The second is that um, there are still, because of the way it grew up, the traditions of public service. They're not as powerful as they were and they don't reach to everybody, but they're still there. And I think it'll be a generation before it changes. And do you think the, the cable systems are having an impact on the network news? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Because in order to watch television, you got to be not doing something else. But think of all the things that chip away at the time you might be watching right. the evening news or something like that. It, it, and I mean new things, not just talking to your children. Um, there are video games. There is the Internet and almost everybody has a computer whom you would want to be watching television. There are cable systems, I don't know, there are about 200 and some odd individual cable program possibilities. There are MP3 players. There are 
all of the old technologies. There are multiplications of things that you might be doing. Each one of those things is small. But if you take a hundred small cuts, you take away a big piece of the main business. Right. And that's what's and happening. And people are getting their news also on the internet. Yeah, and because that's where they are. And all the networks are also on the internet. Well, there's, there's a funny, I believe, incorrect idea that you go to the internet to get your news. That's right. not what happens. No. The news goes to the internet because that's where you Deep are. Thought, yeah. Now, you're, te you're teaching young people who are go mostly young people who are going yeah. into the news business. Are you encouraged at the kind of people who are interested? And is it a big difference from when you started? We I think maybe about 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> I think they're smarter than I was when I started. I think they are wonderful. And I think that they will do great things, not necessarily in the traditional television, newspaper, magazine world we have had, but in one they're going to invent because it's all going to change. How is it going to change? I'm minutes. not sure, but I think that broadband on the Internet will allow you to take this program and distribute it nationally for 12 cents. And that'll change the way the world goes. Well, thank you very much, Richard Seewald, for coming to this show and <laughs> talking with me about it. Uh, we have so much more we could say, but we'll do it another time. Thank okay. you.